Hey friends, it's your teen and tween librarian Rebecca and we're back for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Last episode, things did not go according to plan. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I was reading it and I'm still not quite sure exactly what happened to them, but I think that was the author's intent to just throw that confusion uh, in where they were going, what they, you know, where they were, how were they possibly staying on that raft. Uh, it was very exciting and I think that's one of the things I love about this book so much is we'll have a chapter like this that is super super exciting and action-packed and almost impossible and then it'll follow with a chapter that's a long discussion about scientific theories <laughs> it's, you can't really guess where it's going um, I also love that Jules Verne decided to rip a hole in the ocean as a result of a little too much gun cotton. Uh, we definitely learned that that is effective in blowing up boulders, almost too effective. <laughs> so we'll see what happens to our intrepid explorers in this chapter 42. Enjoy. <laughs> chapter 42, going up, it's a good sign. I suppose it was then about 10 o'clock at night. The first of my senses, which came into play after this last experience, was the sense of hearing. Almost immediately I heard, for it was a real act of hearing, I heard silence fall in the gallery, taking the place of the roar which had filled my ears for hours. Then these words of my uncle's came to me like a murmur. We are going up. What do you mean? I cried. Yes, we are going up, we are going up. I stretched out my arm and touched the wall, grazing my hand. We were rising extremely fast. The torch, the torch, cried the professor. Hans managed to light it, not without difficulty, and the flame, rising in spite of our upward moving, gave enough light to illuminate the whole scene. Just as I thought, said my uncle, we are in a narrow shaft about 20 feet across. The water has reached the bottom of the abyss and is now rising to find its own level, taking us with it. Where to? That I don't know, but we must be ready for anything. We are rising at a speed which I estimate at 12 feet a second, or about eight miles an hour. At this rate, we shall get a long way. Yes, provided that nothing stops us and this shaft has an outlet. But if it's stopped up, if the air is gradually compressed by the pressure of this column of water, then we shall be crushed. Axel, the professor replied very calmly. Our situation is almost desperate, but there are a few chances of our escaping, and I am considering these. If we may die at any moment, we may also be saved at any moment. So let us prepare to seize the slightest opportunity. But what shall we do now? Recruit our strength by eating. At these words, I gazed at my uncle with haggard eyes. What I had not wanted to confess had at last to be told. Eating, I repeated. Yes, straight away. The professor added a few words in Danish. Hans shook his head. What, cried my uncle. Are all our provisions gone? Yes, this is all the food we have left one piece of salt meat for the, for the three of us. My uncle looked at me as if he did not want to understand. Well, I said, do you still think we can be saved? My question went unanswered. An hour went by. I began to feel terribly hungry. My companions were suffering too, but none of us dared to touch the wretched remnant of our stock of food. Meanwhile, we were still rising fast. Occasionally, the air cut our breath short, as it does with aeronauts when they go up too quickly. But while they get colder, the higher they go, we were beginning to feel a contrary effect. The temperature was rising at an alarming rate, and at that moment, it must have been about 40 degrees centigrade. What could be the meaning of such a change? So far, our experience had tended to confirm the theories of Davy and Liedenbrock, until now, special conditions of non-conducting rocks, electricity, and magnetism had modified the laws of nature, providing us with a moderate temperature, for the theory of a central fire remained, in my opinion, the only one that was sound and reasonable. 
Were we therefore coming to a terrain where the phenomena of central heat occurred in full force, and where the heat reduced the rocks to the state of molten liquid? I feared as much, and I said to the professor, if we are neither drowned nor crushed, and if we don't starve to death, we may still manage to be burnt alive. He simply shrugged his shoulders and returned to his thoughts. Another hour went by, and apart from a slight rise in temperature, nothing happened to change the situation. At last, my uncle broke the silence. Look here, he said. We must take action. Take action, I said. Yes, we must recruit our strength. If we try to prolong our existence by a few hours by husbanding this bit of food, we shall f feel weak up to the very end. Oh, the end won't be a long time coming. Perhaps not, but if a change of saving our lives presents itself, and if it becomes necessary to take sudden action, where shall we find the required strength if we have allowed ourselves to be weakened by hunger? But once we have eaten this bit of meat, uncle, what shall we have left? Nothing, Axel, nothing. But will it do you any more good to devour it with your eyes? You are reasoning like a man with no willpower or energy. Then haven't you given up hope? I cried irritably. No, certainly not, the professor replied in a firm voice. What? You still think there's a chance of escape? Yes, I do. As long as this heart goes on beating, I can't admit that any creature endowed with willpower should ever despair. What splendid words. The man who could utter them in such circumstances was certainly of no common stamp. Then what do you suggest we do? Eat the food that is left to the last crumb and restoring our failing strength. This may be our last meal, but at any rate we shall have become men again instead of exhausted weaklings. Very well then, let us eat, I said. My uncle took the piece of meat and the few biscuits which had escaped destruction, divided them into three equal portions, and handed them out. This made about a pound of food for each of us. The professor ate his ration greedily, with a sort of feverish excitement. I ate without pleasure, in spite of my hunger, and almost with distaste. While Hans ate quietly and slowly, silently chewing small mouthfuls and relishing them with the calm of a man whom anxiety about the future could never worry. By searching diligently, he'd found a flask half full of gin. He offered it to us, and it succeeded in reviving my spirits slightly. Faut très flug, said Hans, taking his turn with the flask. Excellent, repeated my uncle. A little hope had returned to me, but our last meal was just over. It was five in the morning. Man is so constituted that his health is a purely negative state. Once his hunger is satisfied, it is difficult for him to imagine the horrors of starvation. Without feeling them, he cannot understand them. Consequently, after a long fast, a few mouthfuls of meat and biscuits banished the memory of our past privations. However, when the meal was over, each of us abandoned himself to his reflections. What were those of Hans, I wondered? that man of the far west endowed with a fatalistic resignation of the east. For my part, my thoughts were all memories, and these took me up to the surface of the globe which I ought never to have left. The house in the Königstrasse, poor Groiben, and dear old Martha passed like visions before my eyes, and in the dismal rubblings which sounded through the rock I imagined I could hear the noise of the cities of the earth. As for my uncle, who never forgot his work, he was carefully examining the nature of the terrain, torch in hand, trying to discover where he was from observation of the strata. This calculation, or rather this estimate, could only be a rough approximation, but a scientist is always a scientist, as long as he retains his composure, and Professor Liedenbrock certainly possessed this quality to an extraordinary degree. I heard him murmuring geological terms which I understood, and in spite of myself I began to take an interest in this final piece of research. Eruptive granite, he said. We are still in the primitive period, but we are going up. We are going up. Who knows? He had still not abandoned hope. With his hand he was feeling the perpendicular wall, and a few moments later he went on. This is nice, and this is mica schist. Good, soon we shall come to the terrain of the transition period, and then... 
What did the professor mean? Could he measure the thickness of the Earth's crust above us? Had he some means of making this calculation? No, he had no longer the manometer and no calculation could take its place. Meanwhile, the temperature was rising fast and I felt bathed in a burning atmosphere like the heat given off by the furnace in the foundry where the molten metal is being poured into the molds. Gradually, Hans, my uncle, and I were obliged to take off our jackets and waistcoats as the lightest covering became a source of discomfort, not to say pain. Are we going up towards a furnace? I cried at a moment when the temperature rose steeply. No, replied my uncle. That's impossible. Impossible. All the same, I said, feeling the side of the shaft. This wall is burning hot. Just as I said this, my hand touched the water and I hurriedly withdrew it. The water is boiling, I cried. This time the professor's only answer was an angry gesture. Then an invincible terror took hold of me and would not be shaken off. I felt that a catastrophe was approaching, such as even the liveliest imagination could never have conceived. An idea, vague and uncertain at first, became a conviction in my mind. I thrust it away, but it stubbornly returned. I did not dare to put it into words, but a few involuntary observations confirmed me in my opinion. In the flickering light of the torch, I noticed some convulsive movements in the layers of granite. A phenomenon was obviously going to take place in which electricity would play some part. And then there was this unbearable heat, this boiling water. I decided to consult the compass. It had gone mad. And that is the end of chapter 42.